Chapter 63 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Discrimination in Reading. A few books well read, and an intelligent choice of those few. These are the fundamentals for self education by reading. If only a few well chosen, it is better to avail yourself of choices others have already made. Old books, the standard works tested by many generations of readers. If only a few, let them be books of highest character and established fame. Such books are easily found even in small public libraries. For the purpose of this chapter, which is to aid in forming a taste for reading, there should be no confusion of choice by naming too many books of one author. If you read one and like it, you can easily find another. It is a cardinal rule that if you do not like a book, do not read it. What another likes, you may not. Any book list is suggestive. It can be binding only on those who prize it. Like attracts like. Did you ever think that the thing you are looking for is looking for you? That it is the very law of affinities to get together? If you are coarse in your tastes, vicious in your tendencies, you do not have to work very hard to find coarse, vicious books. They are seeking you by the very law of attraction. One's taste for reading is much like his taste for food. Dull books are to be avoided as one refuses food disagreeable to him. To someone else, the book may not be dull, nor the food disagreeable. Whole nations may eat cabbage or stale fish, while I like neither. Ultimately, therefore, every reader must make his own selection and find the books that find him. Any one, not a random reader, will soon select a short shelf of books that he may like better than a longer shelf that exactly suits someone else. Either will be a shelf of good books, neither a shelf of the best books. Since if best for you or me, they may not be best for everybody. A most learned man in India, in turning the leaves of a book as he read, felt a little prick in his finger a tiny snake dropped out and wriggled out of sight. The pundit's finger began to swell, then his arm, and in an hour he was dead. Who has not noticed in the home a snake in a book that has changed the character of a boy through its moral poison, so that he was never quite the same again? How well did Carlyle divide books into sheep and goats? It is probable that the careers of the majority of criminals in our prisons today might have been vastly different if the character of their reading when young had been different, had it been uplifting, wholesome, instead of degrading. Christian Endeavour Clark read a notice conspicuously posted in a large city. All boys should read the wonderful story of the Desperado Brothers of the Western Plains whose strange and thrilling adventures of successful robbery and murder have never before been equaled. Price, five cents. The next morning, Dr. Clark read in a newspaper of that city that seven boys had been arrested for burglary and four stores broken into by the gang. One of the ringleaders was only ten years old. At their trial, it appeared that each had invested five cents in the story of border crime. Red-Eyed Dick, The Terror of the Rockies, or some such story, had poisoned many a lad's life. A seductive, demoralizing book destroys the ambition, unless for vicious living. All that was sweet, beautiful, and wholesome in the character before seems to vanish, and everything changes after the reading of a single bad book. It has aroused the appetite for more forbidden pleasures until it crowds out the desire for everything better, purer, healthier. Mental dissipation from this exciting literature, often dripping with suggestiveness of impurity, giving a passport to the prohibited, 
This is fatal to all soundness of mind. A lad once showed to another a book full of words and pictures of impurity. He only had it in his hands a few moments. Later in life he held high office in the church, and years afterward told a friend that he would have given half he possessed had he never seen it. Light, flashy stories, with no intention in them, seriously injure the mind of a brilliant young lady I once knew. Like the drug fiend, whose brain has been stupefied, her brain became completely demoralized by constant mental dissipation. Familiarity with the bad ruins the taste for the good. Her ambition and ideas of life became completely changed. Her only enjoyment was the excitement of her imagination through vicious books. Nothing else will more quickly injure a good mind than familiarity with the frivolous, the superficial. Even though they may not be actually vicious, the reading of books which are not true to life, which carry home no great lesson, teach no sane or healthful philosophy, but are merely written to excite the passions, to stimulate a morbid curiosity, will ruin the best of minds in a very short time. It tends to destroy the ideals, and to ruin the taste for all good reading. Read, read, read all you can, but never read a bad book or a poor book. Life is too short, time too precious, to spend it in reading anything but the best. Any book is bad for you, the reading of which takes away your desire for a better one. Many people still hold that it is a bad thing for the young to read works of fiction. They believe that young minds get a moral twist from reading that which they know is not true. The descriptions of mere imaginary heroes and heroines, and of things which never happened. Now this is a very narrow, limited view of a big question. These people do not understand the office of the imagination. They do not realize that many of the fictitious heroes and heroines that live in our minds, even from childhood's days, are much more real in their influence on our lives than some of those that exist in flesh and blood. Dickens' marvelous characters seem more real to us than any we have ever met. They have followed millions of people from childhood to old age and influenced their whole lives for good. Many of us would look upon it as a great calamity to have these characters of fiction blotted out of our memory and their influence taken out of our lives. Readers are sometimes so wrought up by a good work of fiction, their minds are raised to such a pitch of courage and daring, all their faculties so sharpened and braced, their whole nature so stimulated, that they can for the time being attempt and accomplish things which were impossible to them without the stimulus. This, it seems to me, is one of the great values of fiction. If it is good and elevating, it is a splendid exercise of all the mental and moral faculties. It increases courage, it rouses enthusiasm, it sweeps the brain ash off the mind, and actually strengthens its ability to grasp new principles and to grapple with the difficulties of life. Many a discouraged soul has been refreshed, reinvigorated, has taken on new life by the reading of a good romance. I recall a bit of fiction called The Magic Story, which has helped thousands of discouraged souls, given them new hope, new life, when they were ready to give up the struggle. The reading of good fiction is a splendid imagination exerciser and builder. It stimulates it by suggestions, powerfully increases its picturing capacity, and keeps it fresh and vigorous and wholesome, and a wholesome imagination is a very great part in every sane and worthy life. It makes it possible for us to shut out the most disagreeable past, to shut out at will all hideous memories of our mistakes, failures, and misfortunes. It helps us to forget our trouble and sorrows, and to slip at will into a new, fresh world of our own making, a world which we can make as beautiful, as sublime, as we wish. 
the imagination is a wonderful substitute for wealth, luxuries, and for material things. No matter how poor we may be, or how unfortunate, we may be bedridden even, we can by its aid travel around the world, visit its greatest cities, and create the most beautiful things for ourselves. Sir John Herschel tells an amusing anecdote illustrating the pleasure derived from a book, not assuredly of the first order. In a certain village, the blacksmith had got hold of Richardson's novel, Pamela, or Virtue Rewarded, and used to sit on his anvil in the long summer evenings and read it aloud to a large and attentive audience. It is by no means a short book, but they fairly listened to it all. At length, when the happy turn of fortune arrived, which brings the hero and heroine together, and sets them living long and happily according to the most approved rules, the congregation was so delighted as to raise a great shout, and, procuring the church keys, actually set the parish bells ringing. It all comes back to us now, said the brilliant editor of the interior not long ago. That winter evening in the old home, the curtains are down, the fire is sending out a cheerful warmth, and the shaded lamps diffusing a well-tempered radiance. The lad of fifteen is bent over a borrowed volume of sea tales. For hours he reads on, oblivious of all surroundings, until parental attention is drawn toward him by the unusual silence. The boy is seen to be trembling from head to foot with suppressed excitement. A fatherly hand is laid upon the volume, closing it firmly, and the edict is spoken. No more novels for five years. And the lad goes off to bed, half glad, half grieved, wondering whether he had found fetters or achieved freedom. In truth, he had received both, for that indiscriminating command forbade to him during a formative period of his life works which would have kindled his imagination, enriched his fancy, and heightened his power of expression. But if it closed to him the garden of Hesperides, it also saved him from a possible descent to the inferno. It made heroes of history, not demigods of mythology, his companions, and reserved to maturer years those excursions in the literature of the imagination which may lead a young man up to heaven or as easily drag him down to hell. The boy who is permitted to saturate his mind with stories of battle, murder, and sudden death is fitting himself, as the records of our juvenile courts show, for the penitentiary or perhaps the gallows. No man can handle pitch without defilement. We may choose our books, but we cannot choose their effects. We may plant the vine or sow the thistle, but we cannot command what fruit each shall bear. We may loosely select our library, but by and by it will fit us close as a glove. There was never such a demand for fiction as now, and never larger opportunities for its usefulness. Nothing has such an attraction for life as life. For what the heart craves is not life as it is. It is life as it ought to be. We want not the feeble, but the forceful. Not the commonplace, but the transcendent. Nobody objects to the purpose novel, except those who object to the purpose. Dueling as it does in the hands of a great master, with the grandest passions, the most tender emotions, the divinest hopes, it can portray all of these spiritual forces in their majestic sweep and uplift. And as a matter of history, we have seen the novel achieve in a single generation the task at which the homily had labored ineffectively for a hundred years. Realizing this, it is safe to say that there is not a theory of the philosopher a hope of the reformer, or a prayer of the saint, which does not eventually take form in a story. The novel has wings, while logic plods with a staff. In the hour it takes the metaphysician 
to define his premises, the storyteller has reached the goal, and after him tumbles the crowd tumultuous. With the assistance of Rev. Dr. E. P. Tenney, I venture upon the following list of books in various lines of reading. Fiction The Arabian Nights Entertainment The stories from the Arabian Nights, Riverside School Library, contains many of the more famous stories. 50C Irving Batchelder's Transcriber's Note Batchelder Eben Holden is a good book. 400,000 copies were sold. J.M. Barrie's Little Minister, a story of Scottish life, is very bright reading. Bonyan's Pilgrim's Progress is one of the most famous of allegories. Salvante's Don Quixote is so widely known that any well-read man should not. Its humor never grows old. Ralph Connor's three books, The Man from Glengarry, Black Rock, and The Sky Pilot, have sold 400,000 copies. Of George W. Cable's books, The Cavalier and Old Creole Days are among the best. Dinah Mullet, Crakes, John Halifax, Gentleman, is of rare merit. C. E. Craddock's pseudonym in the Tennessee mountains is entertaining, a powerful story of mountain life. Of F. Marion Crawford's stories, among the best are Mr. Isaacs and A Roman Singer. Alexander Dumas's Count of Monte Cristo is a world famous romance. Of George Eliot, Silas Mana is the best of the short stories, and Romola, the best of the long. Adam Bede ranks barely second to Silas Mana. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre remains a classic among early English novels. Edward Everett Hale's Man Without a Country will be read as long as the American flag flies. Hawthorne's Mosses from an Old Manse are stories of unique interest, and The Scarlet Letter is known to all well-read people. Of Rudyard Kipling, read Kim and The Man Who Would Be King. Pierre Lotti's Iceland Fisherman is translated by A.F.D. Coven. McClurg, one dollar. S. Wire Mitchell's Hugh Wynn sold 125,000 copies. Thomas Nelson Page's Gordon Keith sold 200,000 copies. If you read only one of Walter Scott's novels, take Ivanhoe or The Talisman. Five more of those most read are likely to follow. Henrik Sienkiewicz, Quo Vadis, is most notable. Robert L. Stevenson's Treasure Island and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and The Merry Men and Other Tales are fair examples of the charm and insight of this author. He who reads Frank Stockton's Rudder Grange is likely to read more of this author's books. Mrs. H. B. Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin is still one of the great stories of the world. Of Mark Twain, Huckleberry Finn, The Innocents Abroad, and The Story of Joan of Arc are representative volumes. Miss Warner's Wide, Wide World is unique in American fiction. John Watson's Beside the Bonnie Briar Bush sold 200,000 copies in America. Lou Wallace's Ben-Hur is the greatest of scriptural romances. 38 books by 28 authors. It would have been easier to name 100 authors and 200 books. I will add from the critic a list whose sales have reached six figures. Books of Everyday Life. David Harum by Westcott. 
727,000. Mrs. Wiggs of the Cabbage Patch by Alice Hegan Rice, 345,000. The Virginian by Owen Wister, 250,000. Lovely Mary by Alice Hegan Rice, 188,000. The Birds, Christmas Carol by Mrs. Wiggan, 100,000. The Story of Patsy by Mrs. Wiggan, 100,000. The Leopard Spots by Thomas G. Dixon, Jr., 125,000. Romantic Richard Carvel by Winston Churchill, 400,000. The Crisis by Winston Churchill, 400,000. Grustark by G. B. McCutcheon, 300,000. The Eternal City by Hall Kane, 175,000. Dorothy Vernon by Charles Major, 150,000. The Man's Man by Hall Kane, 113,000. When Knighthood Was in Flower by Charles Major, 400,000. To Have and To Hold by Miss Johnston, 300,000. Audrey by Miss Johnston, 165,000. The Helmet of Navarre by Bertha Runkle. End of Chapter 63 Discrimination in Reading. Recording by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland.